Welcome to Case Closed, the Contingency Fee Podcast. On the show, our team of industry experts interviews contingency fee attorneys. You will discover everything from how they got started to the secrets of their success and what's working in today's marketplace. And now, here's the Case Closed Podcast. Well, good afternoon, good morning to all. This is the next uh, session of Case Closed Podcast, and we have one of the top attorneys in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Please introduce yourself to the audience. Thanks for having me. My name is uh, Luis, and I have a firm out of Atlanta, Georgia uh, named Bader Scott Injury Lawyers, and uh, we practice personal injury and workers' comp. All right. So, uh, Luis, that means uh, Hispanic heritage. What is the heritage? Let's talk food. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm from Puerto Rico originally. Oh, and, the uh, land of Moho, baby. Yes, yes. All right, for all the all the folks out there, I'm a, a fan of Puerto Rican Moho over Cuban Moho. Go Lime. All Lime, right. <laughs> onward, upward, and off to, I had a jelly, by the way. Uh, I had Guanabara jelly in Publix and Sedanos for four years. Okay. Very nice. All right. Tell me where you went to school, please, Luis. Uh, for undergrad, I went to the University of West Georgia, and then I, uh, for law school, I went to uh, John Marshall uh, Law School in Atlanta, Georgia. All right. And what year did you graduate? Uh, from from law school or from law school? Yeah, uh, 2011. Uh, so I graduated right. in 2011. So you're a baby attorney. I yeah, uh, I consider myself a baby in general. <laughs> Twelve years out. Kids. All right, family, kids. Give me the update. Yeah. So I'm married. I have three kids. I have a fourth on the way. So I have two boys and two girls. Oh, and, uh, well, folks, I can tell you, this guy's got to work hard with four kids. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's why, you know, you got to put you got to put it in with that with that many miles of feed. But no, it's uh, it's great. They're awesome. And uh, I never thought I'd have four kids. I'm one of four. Never thought I'd have four kids. And uh, and here I am, I guess, well, living I'm that sure, dream. I'm sure your madre y padre está feliz. Very oh, very, true. very, very true. So they actually this uh, my last uh, baby, which is due in in uh, September, is going to be their 12th grandchild. So they are they are ecstatic. All right. What is the best advice you have gotten in your life and from whom? The best advice I've ever gotten. I've, I've, there's two pieces of advice that really have um, that, that kind of go together. But one of them was for my dad. He used to say, smell the grass. And I used to play baseball. I was a division one athlete. And he always told me to to smell the grass, like just enjoy the moment because you never know when it was going to be your last moment uh, on the field. And I wanted to play pro ball. It didn't materialize. But, uh, you know, every time I smell freshly cut grass, it just reminds me of that time that I can't get back. And so just enjoying the moment that you're in. But the second piece of advice was to extend your horizons. This is a mentor of mine who just recently said, sometimes our horizon is too short. And we think that we can accomplish things much faster than we actually can. We need to extend our horizons and be willing to put in the work. And I think those two things, enjoying the process and extending your horizons, which requires you to enjoy the process, uh, is the best advice I've ever received. Okay, so you enjoy the process, but what's the most frustrating thing about practicing law? The most frustrating thing about practicing law is client expectations. A lot of times clients are not uh, fully aware, even if you try to explain it to them, of how there's multiple parties in a case. You can't control every part of a case. There are things that are totally without, you know, outside of your control and keeping clients happy, you know, in a firm our size uh, can be the most complicated and frustrating part of, of running a law practice. What's the most famous case you've had? I don't think I have a famous case. We just recently settled a pretty massive multi eight figure case um, that resulted from a major plant explosion. And so we can't discuss obviously the amount or anything like that, but it was a, it was a pretty, um, pretty big case. Uh, the, probably the, the most unique case I ever had was a, a case many years ago, about, a, uh, about five, seven years ago where a lady got injured, uh, sticking her head into a dumb waiter, you know, that carries food from one floor to another and, uh, almost got decapitated and fortunately did not, uh, but got seriously injured doing that. And that was a very unique case, you know, on, on liability. Um, and uh, are you using AI to set up, set the Medicare set aside numbers for your workers comp cases? Um, we're not using AI for that at the moment. It's probably there's probably a lot of opportunities there. Oh, with there, AI. there's a, but if you don't, here's your potential exposure. Most companies are over funding the Medicare set aside by forty percent. Mm. Uh, 
to cover their rear ends. Right. Use AI. Uh, it's probably a potential malpractice on your side not to use AI because they're overfunding by 40%. And then your client then has access to that 40% of money. Right. And it's that they're entitled to and it's being held away for medical care that may or may not happen. And but if it's 40% overfunded, it ain't going to happen. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So uh, we have now heard about your biggest case. I'm going to guess, and I'll look at the smile on your case. It was 59 million. Oh, 59 yeah. million. <laughs> I wish it was 59 million. No, it was, it was less than that. <laughs> it was oh, less than that. Coy yeah. young man that you are. <laughs> All right. So do you do mass tort cases? We don't. We don't do mass tort. I, a lot of people have tried to get us into mass torts because we focus primarily on single event accidents. And you can imagine getting a lot of single event accidents is, uh, generally speaking, much more difficult than uh, aggregating a bunch of mass tort cases. We just, I don't have any experience in it, so I've never really gotten into it. Uh, you probably should try because yeah, big big money. Yeah. Uh, how do you get most of your cases? Uh, right now, we we have a kind of a multi prong marketing plan. I, I would say we have about sixty individualized uh, marketing channels that we get clients from. But we would be considered one of the you know mass media type of of law firms. We have TV, radio, billboards, all kinds of lead generation, digital strategy, social media, paid and organic. Uh, so we we get cases obviously referral strategy but we get cases from every kind of source you can possibly think of right now now are you the managing partner because you sound like a managing partner to me yeah so i am uh so i am the co-owner but i act as a coo managing partner of the firm and my business partner is the ceo cmo the, the marketing strategist and uh so we both co-own the firm All right so if you're going to pick with inside the firm folks you got to pick him why because <laughs> he's the guy who has triple calendaring to make sure the deadlines are never missed. <laughs> that is correct. I work with the COO. Uh, so how many bilingual attorneys do you have in the office? Believe it or not, we don't have a lot of bilingual attorneys. Um, they're very hard to find, uh, to be honest. Many of them have kind of like this uh, entrepreneurial type of makeup. Uh, we have, I would say, five of our 30 attorneys are, are bilingual, but our staff is, uh, I think we have somewhere in the 70, 80-ish range um, legal assistants, paralegals that are bilingual. And so they do the majority of the communication. Do you have any languages other than Spanish and English covered? So we, we have uh, Portuguese um, and Spanish is, is all that we have right now in the majority of the firm. And, and then we outsource any kind of interpretation because we do have some, some clients who speak Farsi and we've had uh, some clients who speak Chinese and Korean, but we don't have anybody in-house that, that manages those. Um, what is the training uh, program that you give to your young associates to make them Luis Juniors? <laughs> we have a really comprehensive training uh, program. We have a director of training and development who has put together multiple sources of training, but it's essentially a in-classroom training, video training, plus on-the-job training. We generally assign our young associates a more senior uh, attorney to work with, and they generally do on the job training. And, and most of the time, we don't unleash an attorney into having their own caseload until they've been with the firm anywhere between 90 and 180 days just to get their feet wet doing the things that are not, you know, uh, what you would consider settling cases. So they're spending more of their time doing the behind the scenes things like depositions and, and doing the interrogatories, things that, that you can't really screw up, generally speaking. So because we you don't want to put some, you don't want to put somebody out there on a million dollar case and they're right out of law school. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, w w they did that when I worked as a prosecutor. They just threw you in. I'll never forget my first day as a prosecutor. I prepped because I'm I'm a prep person. I got, get, would get to work at four in the morning. Wow. Yeah. I'm in front of a, a, a judge who's a former Marine and everyone stands to pledge of allegiance in this thing. And I start citing uh, footnotes from Supreme Court case law. And he says, uh, hold on, counsel, and brings up what license yet waiting for the bar exam results. Mm -hmm. But on, there was a specific rule that allowed people to be assistant state attorney or assistant public defenders in Florida at the time. And he said, what, what the hell is this guy doing? I, he's prepped, Your Honor. That, that's how you want the attorneys in your court. Yeah, but it's a little over the top. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, I would say that my very first 
uh, case that I tried. I actually I didn't even sleep. I was up all night until probably about five or six in the morning. I had to get up at uh, six thirty just to try the case. I, I was a, a notorious over prepare. I prepared for things that didn't even matter. Um, just so nervous. It's it's very nerve wracking going to court for sure. Oh yeah, uh, that's one. Of the, it wasn't worth it for me on the defense side because the defense side you make no money unless you uh, creatively build. Right. <laughs> I'm not a creative builder. So what would you say is the describe the most honorable defense attorney event that occurred in your life where you go, I can't believe the guy actually did this. The most honorable defense attorney event. Wow. Yeah. That's a, I would have to think about that. What is the most honorable defense attorney? Is that because it never occurs? <laughs> Probably because it's a, it's so rare. They document those. There, there are books where they document things like that. <laughs> um, honestly, I can't think of anything that was like so honorable that is like even worth thinking about. Um, I don't know. You, you stumped me on that question. I, I'm no, not sure. That is hard to believe that a, a defense attorney <laughs> has actually stumped a qualified plaintiff's attorney. Oh my God, hell must have frozen <laughs> over just now. You know, in my defense, here's here's what I'll say. Oh, in no. my defense, <laughs> oh in, I like that. Go ahead. In my defense, um, I haven't actually I haven't actually practiced law in about five years because uh, our firm now as I manage the firm, it's very hard to oversee you know, all these cases. So it's, I'd have to go back into the archives to remember the, uh, the most honorable thing, but. Oh, I'll tell sure. you what, most honorable, maybe it'll spur you on. I had a case for a very large, well-known company and they're, they own their own insurance care. And the, it was a work comp case and we had seriatim depositions under the rules. And I took over the case. I deposed him and he said, I had a similar psych issue six, seven years ago somewhere. And I saw a doctor in Pinellas County. I don't remember if it's a psychologist or psychiatrist. Well, it's a $5 million case. So I called my client. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speed them all. It's a $5 million case. How much is it going to cost? I had about $2,000 to get all the subpoena issue because there are 175 docs. Okay, do it. I'm in trial in another case out of town, about 100 miles away. I call in to check in the office, and the uh, receptionist says, oh, by the way, uh, Bob and Debbie need to talk to you. Those were my partners. Now, I'm an AV-rated trial attorney. Okay? Right. All, all, like all of them. And they say, what did you do wrong? What do you mean, what did I do wrong? Um, you got a bar complaint. I said, oh, my gosh. Because uh, you subpoenaed records. I said, I always wait twice the notice period. How could I get in trouble? It's properly issued subpoenas. They read it to me. A doctor who had to look for records and didn't have records decided that because he had to look for records that he didn't have, it was appropriate to grieve me. And the bar made me respond. They wow. Jump, right. So I call up the other attorney and I know the guy for years and he became incensed at the bar. He said, this is the reason we hate the bar, because mm. it's stupid. Uh, you waited, and you always wait twice the time for notice of production. I did. I'm sending an affidavit over by courier now. You send it with the bar, your response. So so that was my experience. You got it. Did it I, I, okay, so I did, have a, I did have a situation. You know, when, when you asked the question originally, I was thinking about maybe in a case, uh, but I did have a situation where, so in, in workers' comp in Georgia, if you get fired on a case and a new lawyer gets the case, you, you put a lien on the case, and then you have to negotiate the lien at the end of the case. We had a case where we got a $100,000 offer for a client, a, a new lawyer. He went and looked for a new lawyer. The new lawyer said that, um, that they could get more. They took the case, end up settling the case for $100,000 like three months later. So they didn't get any more money on the case. They didn't get any more value, but we had put a, put a lien on the case and they essentially rejected our lien saying that they, they got the case settled so that the value of getting the case settled was far greater than the work that we had done on the case. And we had a, a defense attorney. We ended up having to try this lien issue, like a bench trial. And we had the defense attorney willing to testify that we did all the work on the case. And <laughs> so that was that was probably the most honorable thing that I've that I've seen happen, yeah. for sure. Which so, is cool. what's your vision for your firm? 
how big are you going to get? For me, I, I've always been a super ambitious person. My goal is I'm, I'm very young uh, still, so I, I still have a lot of years of work left. My goal is to try to drive the firm to a billion dollar revenue firm. I think it's uh, it's possible if we really put in the work over the next 25 years. And but we don't achieve that and fall on nine figures. That's kind of my immediate goal. And so we're, we're this year we'll be halfway there. And so um, I want to get to at least nine figures, but hopefully be at a billion dollars in revenue in uh, well, in the next 25 years. If you did mass torch, you could be a billion dollars in revenue for. Oh, my gosh. Wow. You have to hit the right one, though, isn't isn't that's the thing about the mass tour? It's like, what if what if you don't no, hit the right right no, case? No, no, see, all you have to do is mm -hmm. read outside of law every mm -hmm. day. For okay. Example, there is a new type of claim in Illinois, mm -hmm. and it has to do with employers and your medicals. So you got to research that. You got to read on pharma every day. Mm. Okay, the type of element of damages that I told you about. Yeah. Talk, and I'm going to tell you how to take that today. Mm -hmm. and get double your firm. Wow. We'll talk to you in a moment afterwards, and then it'll be a happy day. You'll have a fifth <laughs> March. Feliz <laughs> Navidad, my friend. Yes. So, what would you like to tell all the listeners to the Case Co's podcast? of why if you're in Atlanta, if they don't hire you, they will regret it. We have one of the best uh, services and systems for processing uh, accident cases, I believe in, in the city of Atlanta, really the state of Georgia. We dedicate ourselves to a high quality care of not only the client, but our employees. And I, I believe that when you treat your employees right, they treat the clients right and ultimately get a better result for, for the client. So for me, I think we're the best of the best. We hire the best of the best, and we have the the tools and resources to manage the claims at scale without sacrificing service. So that's that's my uh, my pitch for the law firm. Well, state the name of your law firm one more time for the audience. So our firm is Bader Scott Injury Lawyers, based out of Atlanta and throughout the state of Georgia, and we represent personal injury and workers' comp clients. Hire them, folks. Hire them. And that is the end of this session of the Case Closed Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of Case Closed, the Contingency Fee Podcast. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and their insight. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Case Closed, the Contingency Fee Podcast is led by industry experts who unlock insights from the nation's top contingency fee attorneys. Each week on the show, the guests share how they got started, secrets of their success, and what's working in today's marketplace. Guests on the Case Closed podcast include successful contingency fee attorneys that will share their secrets so you can close more cases. Tune in each week for a dynamic conversation about winning legal strategies that will grow your business. 